Hey, Backward Compatible listeners, this is Chris. Unfortunately, we lost a portion of our discussion on tropes due to an accidental human error during recording, which we only discovered after the fact. However, we had some great opening segments and made a few salient points in the recording we do have, so we've decided to release this episode in partial form. At the end, I've recapped the missing remainder as best I can recall. We apologize for the error, but hope you will nevertheless enjoy this truncated edition of the podcast. So it's a success story, even though he failed. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris discuss the modern connotation of tropes and flip the script on why and how they can be valuable. Plus, Doki Doki Literature Club, Dialect, Graphics Card Price Hikes, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 123 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. Games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hi. You know, we haven't had a sequential episode since episode 12, and we won't again until episode 1,234. Just saying. All right. Uh, and today's media topic is uh, something we're calling, is it really a trope? Um, we've been seeing some interesting stuff uh, and kind of uh, a, a tendency in certain criticism to dismiss something kind of offhandedly for having tropes. Uh, and so we want to explore a little bit of what do tropes really mean? Um, is something inherently bad if it contains tropes? Um, and kind of the usefulness of tropes or like when uh, the abuse of them might actually become problematic. So I think this will be a good uh, conversation, not just for games, but for media in general. Uh, but first, we have some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Do you guys might recall that on a previous episode, I think it was one of our Halloween specials, I sort of mentioned how I had never really experienced a game that made me actually afraid. Um, you can kind of like, you know, put yourself in the character's shoes in a way, but like I never really felt that particular sense of dread or anxiety or anything like that playing a game. Well, I found the game that did that um, in that I actually had a hard time bringing myself to finish it at one point. Uh, Doki Doki Literature Club uh, has been... Yeah, that just screams terrifying. <laughs> it does. And especially when you look at the title art, you know, it's like very, uh, you know, pink and these cute, you know, anime girls. The thing about this game, and uh, I'm sure anyone listening to this is probably going to have heard at least something about it. Um, so I don't think it's a spoiler to say that it starts off looking like a very sort of standard, generic... Um, visual novel uh, where you're kind of like this high school guy who ends up with a club full of these cute girls and one of them falls in love with you at some point um, but then it takes a turn for horror now, <laughs> now is this one of those uh, those Japanese games that you play with the lights off um, you can if ah. you want um, I didn't <laughs> um, although when I did first play it like actually, Resident Evil right yeah that's what I meant yeah. that's what um, I mean. when I did first play it actually I ha- I basically pulled the 24 hour um, crunch I pulled like an all nighter in which I got just like a two hour nap to get uh, roll with it published and so after that I sort of settled in and I was I'd actually been playing Doki Doki on and off and I'm like okay I'm gonna you know pick this up and keep playing that was a mistake because um, <laughs> I was very tired very tired and emotionally vulnerable um, and um, even knowing because I'm, I'm not going to spoil specifics but even knowing what the twist was was um kind of the moment that this thing shifts into this other genre um even knowing exactly what was about to happen and it being sort of like signaled and i knew the moment it was going to happen what i was going to see on the other side of the door um it still kind of messed with me and the way that it does it is not in kind of like a, a like a sort of like gross way so to speak it's not it's not like really that graphic um what it where it actually gets you is with the um, the music and the the visual presentation um, and actually a lot of stuff that they do with the game itself uh, in order to um, kind of mess with your perceptions of what visual novels are or how um, you should be able to interface with the game. Um, 
it's actually like this really fascinating uh, commentary on um, how we engage with games and especially in sort of the visual novel genre, um, how we think about characters or um, even to some extent how we think about um, mental illness and that sort of thing. So without, again, going into specifics, um, I highly, highly recommend playing this game, even if you're not necessarily a fan of horror. Um, it's short enough that like by the time you kind of get to that turning point, um, even if it's a little bit um, tough, I would say power through it. I actually it took me like a week to kind of find another time when I was well rested and uh, willing to sort of dive back into it, because at one point I actually sat down and tried playing and actually like had this like physical sensation of like, I don't want to subject myself to any more of this right now. Wow. Um, it was impactful uh, and really, really well done. Um, and I again, once you get to the ending and you start to see like how some of these ideas and themes have been played out and explored. Um, it's kind of a cathartic experience too. Cause you come away from it, like kind of feeling like um, really impressed and like really thoughtful about stuff. Uh, it, it's just, it's an incredible game and it's free. Um, if you see it on steam, you might see like a $10 version. It's like the fan pack. It comes with the soundtrack and some fan art and stuff like that. Um, just go with the free version, give it a try. You can probably knock the game out in like six to nine hours, depending on your reading speed and other factors. I would also, though, warn that there's uh, definitely some uh, some triggers that you might want to be careful about. Um, if you are easily disturbed, uh, this game can definitely mess with you. I I'm easily triggered. <laughs> the oh, word yeah. trigger triggers um, me. So. Yeah, I I I'm triggered right now. <laughs> um, and so if you're concerned about specific things, the sort of... Um, the like kind of rating warnings, the content warnings mm -hmm. in the rating will tell you a little bit of like what you might be able to expect. Again, I don't want to like, I don't want to spoil That's fair. what the thing is. Um, but if you feel like you're pretty able to like kind of cope with stuff and handle things um, and you can kind of go into it expecting that you're going to be disturbed, but you'll, you know, obviously recover. Um, it's definitely an experience worth having. And here I thought he had taken up visual novels and dating sims and we were going to have a talk later, but <laughs> Um, I'm actually intrigued. Yeah. Uh, I think doc that this might be one that even like knowing that you're not a huge fan of like sort of anime style writing yeah, and I'm not. Know, JRPGs and visual novels, that sort of thing. Um, I think this is one that you might be able to appreciate as a satire to begin. Mm -hmm. And then as a commentary later, fascinating. Um, and even just like, uh, again, some of the ways that they do things I think are worth talking about. I know that at least Nick and I are wanting to do a uh, table for two at this at some point. Ah. Um, if anyone else plays, I think it'd be a great round table. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely go check it out. Doki Doki Literature Club. Oh, hard to argue with the price tag of zero dollars. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about something that's been bothering me lately. Um, I've been trying to get a new computer. Uh, mine's pretty old at this point trying to go out and buy myself a new rig and not looking for anything too fancy but definitely one that can play some of the newer games that are out there and I, I ran into kind of a snag and that snag is that the price of video cards has shot up dramatically really yes um and I've been I've been looking into it and apparently it's it's actually because of um cryptocurrency miners uh yes yeah, so I'm don't sorry mean, I don't mean children I mean uh people that are mining cryptocurrency essentially things like bitcoin or ethereum etc there's a whole bunch of bitcoin them dwarves oh, so, the so for the for the uninitiated because doc I'm, I'm guessing you don't know how cryptocurrency works in this regard i know enough about it to know that i don't know okay um but i also know that my brother-in-law's made some money off of it and uh that there was an episode of big bank theory about it <laughs> yeah, people have made money off of off of cryptocurrency, of course, and um, plenty of people have lost money. It's somehow um, tied to the hardware itself. Well, essentially, and I, and I know that much. Yeah, essentially, what they can do is with uh, a powerful enough gaming rig, uh, the faster the faster the speed that you can go, you can run it on, um, the quicker you can mine a Bitcoin or an Ethereum, and um, they're worth so much that the idea would be, okay, I'm going to invest in, say, three, four, five, ten mm. of a high-end video card mm. and set up a rig that can specific, that can mine a, for example, a Bitcoin. At this point, even um, though you're going to spend a lot of money to do it. A lot of people like tried to sort of make money by mining when it first started and it was really yes. small. Yes. At this point, it's become um, like enough people have been doing it for long enough that in order to like really make a return on an investment, you'd have to be like talking like, 
enterprise level like i'm buying like a, a server farm yes and, and doing yes. this in order and to make any money and that's actually what people are doing and what's what's happening now is that, the, that it's raised the prices of video cards beyond msrp are you so, serious yes so from nvidia and amd um the two main gpu um manufacturers it's risen well beyond what they what their suggested pricing is and the reason for that is that people are buying one they're buying out the stock two there are scalpers that recognize the scalps, the, the, I'm sorry, recognize the product is being bought out. So they'll buy them out in advance as much as they can and then resell them. So to give a couple of uh, real world examples here, because it's kind of ridiculous. Um, just last year, the NVIDIA uh, uh, GE Force GTX 1060, uh, it retailed for $200. That was in April of last year. Okay. So almost a full year ago. And um, I'm sorry, a little over a full year ago. And now, Right now, um, you can actually see the, that exact same card go for as high as eight hundred dollars. That's insane. And it depends on where you look, because again, a lot of these are being sold um, by scalpers. Which, frankly, I don't think this should be legal. I don't think you should be able to buy something and then sell it for drastically over MSRP. Um, a lot of retailers aren't able to do that. So why should anyone else be allowed to do it? I think hmm. I think that there's something going on here. Um, another great example here: the GTX 1080 Ti um, has a MSRP of seven hundred dollars. However, uh, you can find it being sold online for as high as fourteen hundred. Wow! So, for those of us like myself who are looking for a new um, gaming rig, it's very difficult to find one for a reasonable price because the price of GPUs is so yeah, high. Yeah, you're paying f- a, for a GPU what some people would pay for a gaming rig. Yes, but you need, but the GPU is one of the most, if yeah. arguably, the most important thing. So it's not like you can just, well, I'll just buy a lower end GPU. Because even those one are their prices for them is higher, um, but also it, you're you're limiting what your your system can be. Hmm. Um, Nvidia came out with a statement and specifically said, um, "Gamers come first. So for Nvidia, they they're trying to find a way to make gamer make satiate the gamers that want these cards because they're known as selling graphics cards for gamers. Mm-hmm. And um, AMD and Nvidia are both uh, purportedly working on video cards that actually have no video output Hmm. so they would be completely useless for a a gamer but would actually be optimized for cryptocurrency miners oh fascinating so that's actually how they're trying to get around this issue that's hilarious yes um but until then or until this this market um you know this this bubble bursts from this uh you know nonsense that people stop losing their mind over bitcoin um, i thought it already had burst (laughs) no well it it actually did uh uh year or two ago Mm -hmm. and then it came back and there's a lot of uh, there's some shady dealings going on with that which we won't get into here but um i I will say that it's something to look out for if you're looking for a gaming pc that makes sense it makes no sense but it makes sense (laughs) oh it's very frustrating (laughs) this is role play for role play the mechanics of tabletop role playing games i gotta say i am not entirely sure how to introduce the next game (laughs) question mark uh that i want to talk about uh it's a role-playing game sort of but i would actually call it more like an interactive world builder Mm -hmm. uh i'd say story game kind of sums it up okay story game maybe a little broad but you know i'll I'll take it um it's called dialect and it's uh it's by a company called thorny games which as i understand is made up of linguists right uh yeah linguistics is a sort of major um field of study for them I'm not sure if that's their job or if it's just like a, a hobby but yeah they're definitely very well versed i love etymology mm-hmm. which has nothing to do with bugs um because that's entomology you yes. see that's I was curious no, yes. about this game because y'all were y'all have been talking about it, and I yeah. looked it up, and I the tagline for me kind of sells it, mm. uh, and it says a game about language and how it dies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was our experience as we played it. Um, so short pitch: it's basically a game where the players come together and they're members of what's called an isolation. Mm. This is a group of people that is in either by choice or by necessity kind of cut off from the outside world, and what you're seeing is uh, how. You're sort of exploring their stories, but as you do, you're seeing how their language evolves. Um, They come up with terms based on um, kind of like how they need to communicate or sort of concepts that are unique to them. And then you start to see eventually how the isolation, like you kind of go into it, can see that the isolation is going to end at some point. 
um, whether that's tragically or whether that's just, you know, based on the passage of time, whatever the case might be. But you kind of go into it knowing we're going to see a dialect sort of develop and then sort of become obsolete again because nobody's speaking it anymore. Yeah, well, well said. Um, what I think is interesting about it is that the story almost feels like a little patchwork quilt of tiny stories. And you end up with this sort of emergent uh, tapestry of a culture mm-hmm. instead of it being about a specific character. Yeah. And in the sort of spirit of role play for role play, I think a lot of this happens uh, due to the systems. And so what ends up happening is as a group, the, the rules are fairly um, uh, rigid in the sense that they want you to follow a very specific procedure yes. to sort of set up the game and to play the game. Uh, what you end up doing is you come up with a few, um, I forget the term they use off the top of my head, but like I'll, I'll call them aspects for the time being. Uh, three major aspects of your community um, and kind of like key values, if you will, yeah. um, that define your community, whether or not your character sort of agrees with it, disagrees with it, whatever their relationship is with it. And then you draw cards that kind of give you a, a term or like a type of word or a phrase, uh, for example, a greeting or a word for the future or um, an expletive mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, sort of a filler word, that sort of thing. Uh, the equivalent of an um. Uh, and then you... Uh, sort of match your card to one of your sort of core concepts and then you figure out how that core concept um, and you brainstorm as a group which is super fun you brainstorm how that concept um, informs what words you have formed for the word type of word on your card right um, so an example doc you know the game that we played we were in isolation of androids basically we were it was um, like serious wally <laughs> yeah serious wally uh with humanoid androids yeah, we, were, we were anthropomorphic it mm-hmm. was it was a lot of fun um and basically our job was to make earth habitable again for uh the whole of humanity that sort of um had an exodus from earth due to one reason or another uh and so for example our filler word uh came about we had a, kind of like a discussion about like what would be our filler word uh, and we had something about when our programming, our programming is such that there's kind of like a optimal answer to things when someone uh, asks us something. And so whenever we have more processing that we have to do because we come up with like our own ideas or we have a different idea than what we're maybe supposed to have, um, we have to kind of like process that longer. And so we came up with the just a sound like just a white noise um, that sort of comes out of our uh our vocal units, as you will, uh, in order to... I'm a learning computer. <laughs> to to fill that time uh, while we're thinking about it. Yeah, I, you know, I really liked it. And it's funny that I can still remember some of those words. Uh, I remember the one for uh, hello or goodbye was like sans. Sans, yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of like, uh, you, can, you can skip the uh, traditional greeting of the robot, uh, exchange of information, and I will remain an individual entity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it was just the stop command sans. Mm-hmm. I think that anybody who has a robust enough group that is looking for something, maybe as a world building exercise or just a one shot, should give this a try. I mm-hmm. recommend it on a round table because you have three concentric circles that you build in towards. And so having that round table to start with really, really helps. So we did that and it it was a, a good experience and at least four players, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll say very briefly that the book itself is very well done. Um, good examples of play, good way of explaining something that might be like a little bit kind of abstract in some ways. Uh, and there's also some great uh, segments of the book for those of you who are interested in linguistics um, that are actually written by someone who's a very famous conlanger. Um, who did, you know, among other things, um, Dothraki for Game of Thrones and High Valerian mm-hmm. um, and a few other properties. Uh, and he actually has like a chapter in this book where he breaks down uh, how uh, new words can be formed. They also give you a lot of good tips for um, not just kind of when you're coming up with these new words, um, approaches you might be able to take to, say, appropriating a word or combining words, that sort of thing, in order to form the new words that you'll be using uh, throughout the game. So it's definitely a lot of fun. And if you're a language geek, it's a must play. This is Inbox, where the crew responds to listener questions, comments, and letters to the editor. To join the discussion, email inbox at backward-compatible.com. So this is a comment from Nathan. He says, while listening to episode 121, I wanted to say that the beta patch isn't a fan-made patch. 
It's just the beta version of the latest patch from the devs. Now, he's talking about uh, Age of Empires here, Mm -hmm. which I refer to as the definitive edition. And he has corrected me correctly, I should say. Uh, It was not technically the uh, definitive edition that I was talking about. It was the HD edition. Um, So he says... uh, It's just the beta version of the latest patch from the devs, which has now gone live. Uh, Just uh, most haven't switched back to the main update yet. He said, mostly we wanted the bug fix for the Slavs and didn't want to wait for the live release. Uh, If you consider the HD devs fans, then yes, it is a fan patch, I suppose. Plus, there are three new expansions released since the HD was released. The Forgotten, which was originally a fan expansion, the African Kingdoms, and the Rise of the Rajas. So um, he's absolutely right. Uh, I did my homework and I realized that I had not actually been playing the Definitive Edition because it's not out yet. I've been playing the uh, HD Edition. And then what they're going to do is compile all of that together uh, after a little bit more, uh, let's call it iterative play and uh, there will be a definitive edition eventually. And I think during that same episode, I also mentioned that um, they're going to be releasing the original Age of Empires, AOE 1, and doing the same kind of a process with it, um, at which point they will eventually come out with a definitive edition for that too. I think this is neat, not just as a fan of AOE, but also uh, in the way that they're doing it, by throwing it out to the fans, to the players, and saying, hey guys, work with us as we clean this old game up, make it great again, and uh, that got political, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and and then uh, over the course of a couple of months, we're going to come out with what we will call the definitive edition. And, and so that begs the question to me, uh, can we do this with other games? I mean, we are, we're already getting HD remakes and things like that, but what about games that have old gameplay? Like I would point to the original Warcraft. I would love it if Blizzard would come out with a remake, a reskin, a retool of the original uh, Warcraft Orcs versus Humans. Mm. I would play the heck out of that. Incidentally, they're actually releasing a content patch for um, Warcraft 3, a balance patch, yeah, um, in order to kind of like let the, have more tournaments and stuff like that in Warcraft 3. Uh, okay. Okay. In the near future. So. Well, you know, but Warcraft 3 is, I mean, it aged well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It really did. It was one of those um, Hallmark transition period type games where it's like, uh, okay, now that we know what the controls for a, a, a real-time strategy is supposed to be, go. I would just be concerned with specifically changing the gameplay too much, if at all, because then it becomes a different game. Mm. It's one thing to go in and change and update the graphics or perhaps expand the, the field of view from a 4-3 to a mm-hmm. 16-9 uh, ratio. They did that with Planescape Torment, for example, to much success. Mm-hmm. But if you change the gameplay, um, at a certain point, you're going to end up with a different game. That makes sense. Yeah. Great, uh, great comment. Anyway, thank you, Nathan, for the uh, for the comment and uh, the correction. I love being corrected. I am often wrong. So uh, often wrong, Bracken. That's me. <laughs> I might not even be right about that. This week's meaty topic of discussion. Gentlemen, what is a trope? Actually, that's something I wanted to make sure that you define for us going into our meaty topic because um, it, it has it has more than one meaning, really. And there's kind of the the very the, the literary meaning, the actual true meaning of what a what a trope is. Um, which is essentially just a you know a narrative device, a literary device, something like say irony is a trope. But what I got from when you proposed this topic was we're, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, motifs, repeated elements inside uh, of of different stories that we recognize instantly, and that tend to exist. You know, kind of to your point, across stories, so. across stories, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's different. So and that is more of a um, a broader view of trope. Right. And so I assumed that's what we were going to be talking about in this episode. Is that is that correct? Yes. OK. Um, now, I will give you a little bit of a historical I mean, we've been talking about etymology here. So sure. a little bit of a historical uh, fun fact. Uh, trope is actually a word or phrase interpolated as an embellishment in the sung parts of certain medieval liturgies. That's where it comes from. Hmm. It's a medieval word, which means um, uh, let's call it overacting. Uh, during the uh, 
the, the monastic chant. It's like, um, Brother Patrick, would you please uh, be a little less trope with your with your singing to the Lord? Thank you. Right. So. Oh, I thought you were where you were going with it was the um, the constant repetition in monastic chants. Like they would say something, and then right after it, they would they would have a phrase, and then they would then they would say something else and repeat that same phrase. No, it's it's it's, it's like instead of going ah, uh, you go ah, uh, uh, right. You add in actually, it's like jazz, man. Uh, you just, you, you go, you go with the flow, you feel it. Mm. Right. And, and that's kind of where that comes from originally. Now, nowadays, when we say trope, we're not talking about that, but it's fun to see where words come from. Um, what we're talking about in the idea of a trope is, oh, that is so overdone. I want something new and original. I Wait, saw that ending coming from a mile away. So you're talking about a cliche is what it sounds like. It sounds like it. Yeah. That'd be a good, um, I, I think, uh, Look up in the thesaurus. I think you might find trope and cliche on the on the same line. Although cliche certainly has a negative uh, connotation well, to trope it. Or trope does doesn't. too. It it doesn't. It doesn't. But I think that's the point of this discussion that I want to have today. Is that um, is are our tropes? Um, is it if that's even the right word? Are tropes really just bad, overdone cliches, or are they in fact something closer to an archetype, which is um, a a shortcut way of us getting to the meaning quickly so that we can tell our story. Spoiler, I think our answer is it's the latter if done correctly. The latter if done. Well, we're done here. <laughs> cool. So thanks for joining us, everyone. For <laughs> but, but yes, no, I, I would agree with, I would agree with Chris, Chris's statement. And I think that, um, you know, in storytelling, if you want to connect with your audience, you have to have something, something that they, uh, you have to have a shared experience, essentially. They mm-hmm. have to have something that they can, latch on to that they can recognize i don't want to use the really overused uh term like oh i identify with that because it's not that kind of cheapens it it's not about specifically having um an ex- an exact experience sort of mirrored inside like a, a, a fictional story it's more about having common elements that you can recognize um either within your own life or within stories that you're already familiar with um so that when you're when you're reading a story or you're watching a film or you're playing a video game, um, you don't have to be told everything up front. You don't have to have like tons and tons of exposition to explain every little thing whenever a new um, character or 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 concept or place is introduced, or even even the structure of the story itself. You're not confused by the structure because even the structure itself um, has a connection to other stories that you may have heard, including. Uh, perhaps the way that you view your own life. Wow, that's really profound, actually. Uh, I would draw a connection there. Uh, I've been doing some research into the psychology of storytelling, uh, sort of the deep roots from a human perspective of why we tell stories. Um, you know, I, I worked with a professor once who said that we story told ourselves into existence, but I hadn't always fully understood what he meant by that necessarily. And so, um, I actually got this from uh, from from Jordan Peterson, Jordan B. Peterson, uh, who's been in the news lately. He's got one of the top selling books on Amazon right now for his uh, you know twelve rules of life or whatever it's called. But this is what he says. He says stories are telling how you represent how you act. Think about that for a second. Let me say that again. Stories are telling how you represent how you act. And this is what it means. Uh, this is this is being human. It's thinking about acting representing that and then constructing stories about that representation. And that's literally the first actions of the ancient man that made him separate from animals. If you follow that idea. So the idea that I'm having an idea is what sets me apart from animals. I think this is like ancient Greek philosophy, right? This is, this is, this is pretty standard stuff. And that is, I'm assuming, um, from, from what, at least from what I recall from, psychology as well as it's born out of language yeah because language itself is representational of of the world exactly so therefore once you have language you can represent the world and in, in, in a simple way stories are a more complex way of representing the world right so in other words it's uh it's the ability to imagine a uh, imaginatively uh form an idea in my head about what something would be like if i did it and then uh die in my imagination and not actually die by trying it you see, and and arguably, uh, you know, advanced creatures are the ones that can do that, and and that's one of the things that makes us human is the ability to go, uh, yeah, you know, if I try that, I'm going to die, and and 
we've been pretty good about that for a million years and we haven't died. So, you know, uh, it, it, some of us anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think whenever we, we ask this question about our media is something really a trope. I think what we're saying is, um, is it so deeply ingrained in us that we don't actually need to tell this story? Is it so automatic that we don't actually need this element? Um, and if so, we could say that that is uh, a, a trope, that if you're focusing on those elements, it's a bad story. Whereas if you're using those elements that are sort of uh, universally recognizable elements in order to tell good story, um, again, I'll, I'll use the word, um, you know, archetype. If it's an archetypal element, then I would argue that it's less about being a trope and it's more about uh, being able to quickly get the audience to where you need names are a great example of this. Yes. Character names. I mean, cause if I have a character and in the first sentence, I tell you Dirk Steele jumped from the rooftops down into the alley below. It sounds like a pulpy adventure story. Already, you're yeah. there because yeah. of the name I chose and the setting, right? There's there's baggage that comes along with that. Now, you know, maybe Dirk Steele is struggling uh, with his uh, relationship with his mother, and maybe that's what the story is really about. And that's an interesting story because I go there within a couple of paragraphs, but that's not where you start at. And it becomes interesting because of that. Is that a trope? Yes. Okay. I would say so. Is that a bad thing? No, well, you haven't really given us enough about your story to know for sure. Well, that's because I'm making it up on the spot. Right. I, would say, I would say not necessarily. And the thing that you that you were talking about, I mean, that's the way I think of tropes, is it's just a way for um, the storyteller to um, populate the, 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 sto the world and make it, you know, as, as, as rich as they can. And then um, the story itself, you know, it makes a good story. It's not going to be... Um, about the fact that those tropes exist. It's just the tropes fill in those gaps so that you can focus on whatever the story might be, right? Yeah. So, um, for example, Rocky, the original Rocky. It's one of my favorite films of all time. And it's full... It's Adrian. full. Yes, it's full of tropes and it's full of archetypes and it's it's full of these, you know, r repeated motifs that we see in a whole bunch of stories about, you know, it's a tale of an underdog. It's it's the story mm -hmm. of an underdog and it's it's about, um, you know, a, do a down and out, you know, boxer who... Um, never really got a shot and so it connected with connects not just with um you know we, re we recognize the story but it connects with people when because everyone has that you know oh I, I i or not everyone but a lot of people have that oh i could have done this but i went this other way or oh i i thought i had potential in this but i didn't quite do it you know it's that kind of that feeling that that is invoked and even even if you haven't experienced that yourself you know someone who has so it's a, it's a common uh um aspect of humanity that you can connect with right yeah but the story itself even though that's that's like the under that's the underlining that's what kind of props the story up that's what connects you and draws you and attaches you to it um but the story is really about this one you know person rocky and his personal journey and um you know his his successes which uh spoiler for those who have not seen the film he doesn't win at the end in terms of the actual boxing match. And that's but why he, it's a good story. Right. But he wins on a personal level. Yes. You know, he, it changes his life. This yes. whole experience changes his life. It changes the life of the people that he meets as well. And it changes the life of his trainer. Mm -hmm. It changes the life of, um, you know, his friend. It changes the life of his friend's uh, sister, the girl that he's, uh, Adrian, who he regularly hits on. It changed everyone around him. And it changes the whole city. They're all affected by by him. So it's a success story, even though he fails. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it such an interesting story. And of course, the, I guess, overarching goal, maybe the meta goal of a story like that is to change the viewer as well. Yes. Uh, you know, that we can walk with him and empathize with him and take away from his story a lesson. And it gets back to exactly what I was just saying, that we can visualize it, spend an hour and a half with, with Rocky, mm -hmm. instead of spending eight, ten uh, 12 weeks of our life in misery, learning that lesson the hard way ourselves mm -hmm. or, or spending or whatever, or spending, you know, a decade trying to be a boxer, realizing that you, you can't do it. And then hoping for a lucky break right. and then, you know, like repeating the same story. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's yeah. like, it, it said, it sort of gives you that, Hey, you know, what if it's almost like a lot of our storytelling too it is a what if question. And I'm afraid that this is where this week's recording was cut off. 
We continued talking for another 25 minutes or so and brought up a number of points relating to the role of tropes in storytelling and in gaming. Relating them at one point to the way games can take advantage of familiar systems or control schemes to avoid reinventing the wheel and sometimes subvert expectations during play. Uh, We also made a case for the impossibility of avoiding tropes entirely, as a visit to tvtropes.org will show you just how many tropes people have managed to spot in your favorite game, movie, or TV show. If you haven't already spent some time going down that rabbit hole, we highly recommend it. It's actually pretty fascinating. Echoing the sentiments of previous episodes, our general consensus was that a work should not be dismissed offhand for having recognizable tropes, but should instead be judged for the creator's skill in combining familiar elements in a way that begets originality, in what ways they thoughtfully follow and break convention to create a unique experience. Humans are pattern-loving creatures, after all, and anything too unfamiliar will tend to make a shutdown even faster than a lazy and derivative use of tropes. But as always, we're interested to hear your thoughts. If you'd like to fill in the blank with your own thoughts on tropes, please feel free to write in. Agree with us, disagree with us, it's all fair game. We look forward to responding to you in a future episode. But for now, dear listeners, I'm Chris. For Jim and Doc, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.